Good morning again. I hope you are all well and doing well, and we're happy to be together. Uh, somebody said this morning that one of the symptoms, you know, of COVID is brain fog, and uh, I asked if I'd had any of that, and I said, uh, I'm, I don't know, we're about to find out. So uh, I said, I'm just thankful to have an excuse that if the sermon's terrible, I have something else to blame it on. Uh, so, But we're uh, continuing a, a series we started now three weeks ago. We only got one lesson in. If I'd known it was going to fall like this, obviously we would just wait and started. But uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, where we're considering uh, some things from Scripture, from, from Ecclesiastes, uh, in regards to... to um, the wisdom that we're trying to gain in our lives to help us really this morning and, and really an ongoing theme through this series is, is really about how do we as people live content? How do we live in a way that we're, we're happy and happy to be in the here and the now? And I just want to quickly review just a couple of things. One, I just want you to notice the first picture up here on the screen that we noticed uh, the first week is, I, I want you to have this image of Forrest Gump. Uh, this image of Forrest Gump, uh, and it just so happened that while I was under quarantine, I, I got to watch Forrest Gump again. Uh, and, you know, he just takes off running. He's not going anywhere. He's not got any plans. There's no uh, rhyme or reason, but he takes off running. And he's just, as Ecclesiastes teaches us, he's just chasing after the wind. It's kind of meaningless, and that's why he gains this following, and everybody thinks he's doing it for this great cause, and everything's great, and, and he was just running, you know? And he gets tired, and what does he do? He just says, I think I'm going to stop now. And he stops, and, and everybody's disappointed because they realize that all this time they've been running, and they think there's this great cause, and they're going to discover the great meanings of life through Forrest Gump, and they realize that in reality, they're just chasing after the wind. And that's what the text taught us as we talked specifically, we kind of introduced the series and we talked about the fact that, that obtaining great wisdom would not equate to uh, contentment in our lives. Let's look at a few of those passages we looked at. We looked at Ecclesiastes 1 where it says, I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. All the things of the earth, all the things in this realm are meaningless. They're all just a chasing after the wind. Just a, uh, the, a couple of verses later into verse 16, it says, I said in my heart I have acquired great wisdom. And this is what we focused on a couple a few weeks ago, the, the idea of wisdom and that we can't count on wisdom to gain. Just because we gain wisdom does not necessarily mean that we're going to gain contentment and happiness in our lives. He says, I've acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. I, I've got more wisdom than anybody who has ever lived. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom. And for lack of a better term, if, if this is Solomon speaking, you know, let's just assume it is. Solomon says, I, I applied my heart to know wisdom. I applied it to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also was just a striving after the wind. No matter what I tried to chase after, I became obsessed with becoming wise. And I, I figured that if I could just become the wisest person to ever live, then, then I will have happiness and contentment. Then I will sleep on my pillow happy at night. And he said at the end of that journey of, of trying to become the wisest person to ever live, I, I reached the pinnacle of wisdom. And it was just a striving after the wind. It was just a, a chasing after the wind. And what we gained from that as a church is we asked, I asked us to try to be present in the here and the now. You, you know, we can always be trying to reach out for something. And what happens when we reach out for stuff constantly and we're just trying to grab more and more and more, we find ourselves never able to be happy here, now, sitting with who we are and where we are in our life. We're always constantly trying to change the external factors of our life. And in, in doing so, it's just a chasing after the wind. It's an, an emptiness that happens. It's been said that contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want. Contentment is the realization of how much you already have. 
you know, we don't come to a point of contentment when we achieve this thing that's out here because as soon as we achieve that thing that's out there, there will be a, a next thing to achieve. But rather, contentment is when we can say, I'm happy here. And while I may strive towards more contentment, I may strive, I may strive towards more wisdom, I may strive to, towards several things in my life, when can we stop and say, I'm okay where I'm at? And, and getting to that place, getting to that spot, is not necessarily something that's checked marked on a thing. It's a decision that we make as people of God to say, I'm going to be happy here. Here may not be a place that the world says I should be happy. Here may not be something that I dreamed of where I wanted to be at this point and stage in my life. But here is where I'm going to choose to sit and be happy. And that's the, what the author teaches us and moves us to do. And we noticed that with wisdom last time. And today we're going to notice another thing that so many people try to find their value in, in this world. Yet they come up at the end of it and they realize it was just all a striving after the wind. Notice what Ecclesiastes says. We're going to be in chapter 2 today primarily. Uh, this is a, Ecclesiastes is a longer book. We're not going chapter by chapter. Uh, but we are, last time we were in chapter 1, this time we're in chapter 2. We're going to do two or three more lessons uh, in this series. But in chapter 2, uh, Solomon, uh, or, the, or the writer here, says, I, I undertook great projects, achievement. And he says, I built houses for myself, wealth, and I planted vineyards. I, I had wealth unknown and I made gardens and parks and I planted all kinds of trees in them. I had everything that a person could dream to have during my era and my stage of my time. Uh, I, when I was a kid, I, was, uh, I loved watching movies. I don't know if y'all remember some of these movies, but like movies like Richie Rich. Anybody in here seen Richie Rich? Okay, this, this, it's about this kid who has like everything, right? Uh, and, and you just dream, what if I could be there? What if I could have a playground inside of my house, right? What if I could be driven to school in a limo every day? What if I could have all that stuff? I used to think as a kid, I would be so happy. And Solomon's saying, listen, I've had it all. I, I, you know, I've, I've had achievements. I've, I've created great projects. I've had stuff to look at and say, man, I can be proud of that. And I've had vineyards, and I've had everything you could possibly name. He continues down verse number 10. He says, I denied myself nothing that my eyes desired. You know, many times in my life, and I imagine you have been there too, I've sat down and said, wonder how much money I would have to have in order where I could just never have to worry about money again. Done that? You, you've thought through that? What's, what's the dollar figure? that I could achieve, and then I would have the ability to be content. Solomon says, I, I had everything my eyes desired. Noth I refused my heart no pleasure. Whatever I saw, whatever I wanted, I got it. And it seems to me that even in this culture, which wasn't an instant culture like ours, he had it when he wanted it. He got it quickly. He was able to achieve it quickly. You know, I, I, I see people in our world, I mean, just if you had $2 billion today, you could own an airplane tomorrow, couldn't you? You wouldn't even have to wait on it. You could have it now. Well, Solomon was the closest thing in his day and time to that. He says, I didn't, I, I, anything I saw, anything I wanted, anything I wanted to obtain, I, I just took it. It was mine. He says, my heart took delight in all my labor. It was fun when it was happening. He says, my, my heart took a delight. I was pleased with the things I was able to accomplish and do in this world. And he says, and this was my reward for all my toll. Yet, he said, in the here and now, what I achieved then, that was the reward. Yet when I surveyed, when I, when I looked back, when I, when I looked back on everything that my hands had done, what I had told to achieve... All the things my mind dreamed up. And we made them into reality. At the end of it, everything. This is what Psalm says. Everything was meaningless. 
Everything was just a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. I was still the same person having to live with the same thoughts and go through the same days and wake up in the morning and I still had the same hurt and sore back. I still had all the things that make us human. I, I achieved all that I thought would make me happy. And at the end of the day, I found it all to be that striving, that chasing after the wind. And nothing was gained under the sun. He continues just here in a few verses later. I have to open. There we go. He says, for a, a person may labor with wisdom. A person may labor with knowledge and skill. And when they must leave all they own to another who has not told for it. I, I spent my whole life achieving all of these wonderful, powerful, magnificent things. And then I'm going to leave it behind to somebody who didn't have to work for it. I've been really, um, I find it really interesting when a lot of people who gain a lot of wealth in this world uh, choose not to leave a lot behind to their kids. You've seen some of these multi-billionaires who uh, they, live, they still give more to their kids than you or I will probably ever see in a lifetime, but they don't just leave everything behind to their kids because they want them to have some sense of earning it and to have some purpose in their life. And I think there's some wisdom in that. He says, listen, I, I did all this stuff. I gained all these vineyards and houses that I built and structures that I built. It, it was mighty and it was wonderful and it was powerful and it was excellent. And I just got to, I'm going to die. And then somebody's going to come along. They're not going to appreciate it the way I appreciate it. They're not going to have the same uh, sense of accomplishment that they had. He says, I'm going to have to leave it all behind. This too, he says, it's meaningless. It's a great misfortune. Does it really add up in the end to something significant? He says, what do people get for all the toil and for all the anxious striving which they labor under the sun? This is what happens. Uh, you know, we're, uh, I really, at some point we're going to do a series really around the basis of work and how people as Christians and how people as humans, we're designed, we're designed by God to be people who work. And who have accomplishments. And, but this is what happens when the work. We don't find joy and benefit in the work. But rather we're just trying to accomplish stuff. He says what do I get for all of that? For all the toll and the anxious. I'm just always trying to achieve this next great thing. He said and what's the payoff? He says all their days. Their work is grief <clears throat> and pain. It wasn't fun to me. Because I was just trying to accomplish and get to the end product. He says, even at night, their minds don't rest. They're constantly worrying about how do I obtain the next thing, the next stage of my life, the next uh, accomplishment, the next building I can build, the next house I can build. He says, this too is meaningless. It doesn't bear the fruit of what I imagined in my mind it would add up to. In this world. And then the next verse. Ecclesiastes 2. Begin verse 26. It says. To the person who pleases him. To the person who pleases God. They're going to have wisdom. And they're going to have knowledge. They're going to have happiness. That sounds a lot like contentment to me. How are they going to get it? God. Is going to give them wisdom. And knowledge. And contentment. You see, the problem is not wanting to be content in this world. There's something in us that wants to be settled and, and relaxed and be able to be happy in our own skin. And it's not that, not that we shouldn't want that. It's that we look for it everywhere. And at the end of the day, it's God that will give the wisdom. It's God that will give the knowledge. And it's God that will give the happiness. It's God that provides contentment. And he says, but to the sinner, to the one who's not seeking after the things of God, he gives the task of, of gathering and storing up wealth. He's just going to keep trying to get more and more. And then he's going to hand it over to the one who pleases God. You know, there's, there's going to be a time where he's, he's not even going to have it in his hands anymore. He says, this is meaningless. There's chasing after the wind. They really can't accomplish what it is that they want to accomplish. 
<coughs> excuse me. I remember the, I read a story about a man who was a uh, in a king's court, and he was um, he was not uh, he was just a, a minion in the king's court. He was just a, a person who would do immediate menial task in the king's court. And he was always happy. Everywhere he went, he was just happy as could be. And the king wanted to know why this man, who he paid very little money to do what he was supposed to do, why was this man always happy? And he asked one of his advisors, he said, why is this man always happy? And, and he asked the man, he said, why are you always happy? He asked him first. He said, well, I've got a roof over my head, and my family is, is healthy, and I'm happy with where I'm at in this world. So he asked the advisor, because that didn't make sense to him, because he's a king, he has all this stuff, and he can't find happiness the way this man finds happiness. He, he says, I, you know, I have a roof over my head, and my family's healthy, why am I not happy? So he asked one of his advisors, he said, why is this man happy? He said, I've got something I want you to do. He said, take and give this man 99 pieces of gold, and leave it with him. Don't tell him where it came from. Leave it with him. So they take 99 pieces of gold. They take it to the man's house. And they put it on his porch. And, and the man is elated because he has money he's never seen before in his life. And so he begins, sits down to count the money. And he gets to it and he counts it. And it equals 99 pieces of gold. And he counts it again because who gives somebody 99 pieces of gold, right? You give somebody 100 pieces of gold. He says, where's the hundredth piece of gold? And this man who lived in the king's courts and was happy when he didn't have any pieces of gold, he says, I've got, I've got to find, I've got to create, I've got to generate that last piece of gold. So I have a hundred pieces of gold. And the story goes on to tell about the fact that he was never able to obtain that last piece of gold. And he spent his life trying to obtain that last piece of gold. And he went from a poor man who was happy as can be to a man who had great wealth. But he kept trying to gather the next thing. And was never able to find the contentment that he had in this life. This reminds me, this, uh, all of this reminds me of a parable that's taught in Luke 12. It's a parable you probably know. Uh, it's a parable we sometimes call the rich fool. And it's about a man who owned, uh, is the text Jesus says this way, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He, he had much to gather, much to gain. And he thought to himself, what, what am I going to do with all this? He says, I don't have enough room to store all my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger barns. And there I'm going, to stir, I'm going to store all my surplus all my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, drink, eat, drink, and be merry. Now we all know the, that that's not what would have happened. But in his mind, he said, if I could just get there, I will have obtained happiness. And here's what the text says. God says to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. And then notice this, and I think this is really important when we talk about riches and wealth. I don't want to demonize that because riches and wealth are not inherently bad. But the text points out really clearly what makes riches and wealth okay and not okay. It says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. And we know from all the other texts that, that, that being rich towards God also means being rich towards others. You know, when we're good to other people as Christ followers, and we're being good to God. We're, we're being Christ's hands on this earth to the poor and to the disenfranchised. He said, listen, it's not money, it's the state of mind in which you have money. And I've said this plenty of times, you can be poor and be guilty of the sin of riches. Because if all you ever want is to try to obtain more and more and more and more, you're no different than the rich man who has a lot and keeps wanting to obtain more and more and more. He says, listen, 
What's key here is that we make sure that we are also, that we live a life that is rich toward God. No matter what dollar figure is in your bank account, are you rich toward God? So what's the culmination? What's the end? What's the, the conclusion of all this? Here's the conclusion of all this. And it was straight, it's really straight out of Proverbs, really. Contentment, happiness, wisdom, riches. It's not earned. Uh, it's not found. It's not achieved. Right? That's why we think we can gain a contentment by just if we gather all the stuff or we gather all the knowledge, whatever it is, we'll gather all of it together. And then, then we'll be content. And then we get all that and we reach that point and we just want the next thing. It's, it's not something that we can achieve, but it's a grace that God gives us. It's something that God can give us. A peace of mind that surpasses all understanding. People don't understand why can we be, why can some Christians be poor and still happy? It's because God is the one that provides us contentment. So if you want contentment in your life, you want to rest easy at night, you want to lay your head on the pillow and go to sleep and not have to deal with the stress and the worry, let me tell you, don't chase after wisdom. Don't chase after knowledge as the thing that will make you happy. Don't chase after riches as the thing that will make you happy. If you obtain those things in this world, choose to use those things for God, but they're not the things that are going to make you content. The things that are going to make you content in this world or is choosing to find your identity and your happiness in God alone. We went through a season, and we're still going through it in our country and our world, where it's like everybody's telling us that if we can just get to this, we're going to suddenly be happy, and the United States is not going to have any more stress, any more pressure. Everything's going to be fine after that. And some people have different, you know, there's all kinds of different ideas about what it is that's going to get us to that point. Well, let me tell you something. All those ideas that you think, you, that I, I'm not even getting to politics. I'm just telling you the truth. There's no amount of stimulus money that's going to make you content. There's no political policy that's going to make you content. Now, whether or not those things are good to do or not, I'm not even getting into that. It's not relevant to what I'm saying. I'm just saying that if those are the things that you're saying, if I can just get my next amount of money, or I can just get my next thing, or if we can just reach to this, if we can just get this, then I'll be able to be happy. You've got it all wrong. Contentment is found in a life in Jesus. Contentment is found in a life with God. If you want real contentment, contentment that the world that that doesn't make sense is so good, you're going to have to find it in God. May that be our rallying cry that I want to be content, I want to be happy, I want to lay my head down peacefully at night, and may we realize that that can only be accomplished through God. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your goodness to us. You you bless us with so many riches in this world and we just pray that we'll be the kind of stewards that, that move that back to, to you and give back to you and are rich towards you. We realize that there's a striving after the wind when, when our, our life's mission is just wrapped up in obtaining more. Uh, God, we, we, uh, and, and it doesn't have purpose. Um, we're thankful for many people here in this church and throughout the church globally who, who have obtained much so that they can serve others and what a powerful influence they are and what a powerful image they are for us as Christians. But we're also reminded that many strive after those things just to obtain more and more. And they, they're discontent today. They're struggling. They, they're trying to find where they can find their peace. God, help us to find our peace in you. Help us to find our peace only in you. Because we know everything else is just a striving after the wind. Help us not to chase the wind, but rather chase after you. We thank you for the ability as Christians to share in communion and be in relationship with you. And we praise you for that ability. In Jesus we pray. And the church together says, Amen. The best life is the Christian life. It's not always the easiest life. Nobody ever promised it would be the easiest life. But it is the life where you can find contentment. If you've never started your walk with God... We would love for you to talk to you about what it takes to start that walk with God today. 
Or maybe you have, maybe you're a Christian, maybe you're a Christ follower, and you're here and you're saying, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christ follower, but I haven't found contentment. I've been putting my hope and putting my trust and putting my faith in all the wrong things. I encourage you today, whether or not you do it in the pew, whether or not you come and say, I need people to surround me in prayer, whatever it is, I just pray that today you'll make a decision in your heart that you will chase contentment through a relationship with God. And I believe, I'm convinced, I'm thoroughly convinced, you will find contentment there. The contentment you've been missing, the contentment that you've been wanting. But if you have a need and you want people to surround you with prayer, we're, we want, as your family, to do that. If you have that need, come while we'll stand together and see.